All right, you are good to go, sir. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Gillian Bowser, Associate Professor of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. Before joining Colorado State, Dr. Bowser earned degrees in biology and zoology at Northwestern University, University of Vermont, and the University of Missouri, St. Louis, um, and then had a, a a uh, long stint working as a wildlife biologist and ecologist with the U.S. National Park Service, um, meandered a bit too, going to Joshua Tree, um, you know, the Tetons, working in a few different parks, which sounds really lovely. Uh, and her research focuses on ecological indicators of climate change, uh, as well as linkages between changing ecological conditions, local community livelihoods, and climate. Um, she's also dedicated to improving equity and inclusion uh, in the natural sciences. Um, her current interdisciplinary work looks at biodiversity indicators and high elevations around the world, um, insights of which I believe she's going to share with us this afternoon. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen, the usual starters. Um, oops, now that I said I'm going to do that, give me two seconds. But thanks so much for having having me again. Um, we talked yesterday and that was kind of fun. Um, and we'll do a little bit more details today. So it will not be the same as yesterday, but be more focused on um, some of our current work, um, which we just started. So I will say in advance that we start, I hope you can see my screen okay. So if you give me a thumbs up. Um, we started this project last year, so we don't have total data yet. Um, so we have a lot of ideas and in another year we'll have data. So I want to talk about management actions and participant-based data sets. And I think it's particularly important in today's world, uh, not only of Zoom, but also of citizen science, because the Park Service and other federal agencies actually um, passed a recent notice from the Federal Register to use citizen science to address management actions. And what I want to do is sort of walk a little bit through what this actually means um, and why it's important to just sort of think through all the pieces of citizen science management actions and national parks as three different entities um, that come together. So I want to start with the basic idea is to ask the question, can you detect quality or decline with citizen science data sets in protected areas or areas that are sort of geographically limited and that's an important piece that you're just looking at one area and trying to figure out if you can answer that question with um, citizen science data and i want to also spend a moment and i'll talk about this slide in a second but it was in a moment that when we look at protected areas that protected areas themselves are an entity that we just define on the on the landscape you know whether it's with a sharpie pen for starters to say here's a boundary or whether the boundary actually follows some you know ecological resource like a river or something like that so the protected area itself has this sort of interesting piece of bias associated with it and then you know, like we talked about before is that people protect what they love both inside the national park and also how they come up with management actions in that park and so you think about pollinator data and citizen science it's highly biased because of that and that bias will tell us a story. The story is connected to a culture, whether it's an American culture or a smaller culture, a new culture, an old culture, and a culture will connect it to a people. And so understanding that bias, when we're trying to tell a story about the climate change or, or particularly pollinator loss or biodiversity loss in our national park system, um, we, we always have to balance these things and think about how we tell that. And parks balance, both natural and cultural resources, but they also balance with the visitor experience. So when we bring citizen science as one of that part of the visitor experience into a national park to ask a question, all that is being balanced with, you know, where are you allowed to go? What are you allowed to, to collect? Um, are you allowed to lethally collect or non-lethally collect? Um, can you even step, step off the trail to ask that question? And thinking about then, okay, now how do we answer that bigger question of pollinator decline? Well, let's look at mountains for a second. And once we get there, I want to go through, you know, why pollinators and biodiversity loss, in particular in protected areas worldwide, is an emerging issue. 
And actually, we're, there are 36 universities worldwide as part of a, a European Union project called the Highlands Project, which is looking at just this question uh, for these high elevation areas and looking more at indicators and biodiversity loss. You know, how are we measuring these things? And how do you address this decline within the boundaries of a national park? Because the park will have boundaries that very often are not on ecological systems. They're, um, you know, management or administrative systems, you know, like straight squares or whatever the park has decided to do. And then what management actions within those boundaries may contribute to that decline and cause that decline to be more either catastrophic or changing? And then who participates in the collection of that data? And do you really need species identification? It's an important piece of this. And then who is the real audience for the resultant data that you collect um, and then why that matters? So let's take a moment from the 30,000 foot view, the sort of scientific view up there with, you know, Rocky Mountain Biological Station and other hires, is that mountains and climate change impacts, particularly on the cryosphere, the, the, the environments with ice and glaciers, et cetera, are, are pretty profound. Um, and the climate change impacts are predicted to accelerate, um, particularly in mountain systems, and are right now accelerating quite rapidly. So if you look at this graph, and this is from the IPCC's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report in 2019 on ocean and the cryosphere. And the thing just to notice is that red means bad. We're expecting massive impacts, so either on tundra, lakes, tourism, agriculture, whoops, sorry about that, um, et cetera. And the number of dots is the confidence of that. So you can see, if you look at the Western United States and Canada, we've got a bunch of areas of red that we're concerned about with the tundra. Um, rivers, streams, tourism, et cetera. I think skiing here in Colorado, um, those types of tourism industries are heavily impacted by changes in the cryosphere. But interestingly enough, in the United States um, in particular, and in many places out in the world, but we tend to protect the tops of mountains. We sort of like doing this. We have a lot of parks that are built around scenery, actually more parks are actually built on scenery than wildlife. If you look at the National Park Service system as a whole, very few are actually built around wildlife. Some are built around wildlife fires or wild flowers, excuse me, um, such as Joshua Tree National Park was actually originally put aside for desert wild flowers and not for climbing or anything else. Um, so it's important to think about the, that the boundary gets drawn a lot around high elevation areas. Rocky Mountain National Park right next door to us is a great example of that. So these areas are rapidly changing. And so the question becomes with biodiversity loss is what are some of these early warning systems of these changes? And when we're looking at biodiversity loss, how are we measuring it? And is it more attenuated in the higher elevation systems? And I like this, this is one of our research sites. And one of the nice thing about looking at this research site is that we actually, I have two species in the Bombus group and the, in the bumblebee group that are now occurring right next to each other. And the one species originally normally occurs at 4,300 meters above sea level or higher. And the other one occurs less than a thousand meters above sea levels or lower. Um, and it's interesting that the lowest length species has now shifted so far upland that you can find it in the same field as a high elevation system. And yet this is all within the context of glacier shift and glacier retreat in the same mountain system. Excuse me. So when you think about colonies and high elevation systems, where does citizen science come in? And the, the sort of word on the street today is thinking about systematic data gaps and how citizen science may be critical for us to, to fill in these systematic data gaps and get these systematic data gaps to understand, and I apologize, I have no idea why it's advancing on its own, um, systematic data gaps that are, we don't have the information on the species in advance. So to address the decline, we need to get that baseline data first. So our project is a little bit about the parks and pollinators looking at biodiversity loss and then asking this sort of complicated question about if we do a management action within this park that integrates either cultural or natural resources or both and the visitor experience, what is our impact 
on pollinators? Are we accelerating their loss, reducing loss declining, or are we neutral to that loss? And this becomes actually a very difficult question to answer. And I want to sort of walk through why the biases are important to acknowledge as you try and answer this question. So on the left-hand side, when we talk about this decision tree and how we think about the data moving before we ever get to measuring anything in the field, and then why that's important in the management action context, because that will tell us our citizen science approaches. And that becomes important for what data actually comes forward and why the bias in particular types of data are associated with that activity. So I'm gonna walk through this matrix and some of these sort of ideas of how parks sort themselves to give you an idea of the background behind this project, we have 65 parks currently in the project, and we will be sampling eight of those parks with the idea of, of going up to a larger number of parks with the consortium institutions involved. So we're gonna walk through this tree for a second. So when you think about management actions in a park, and I, I can't see the chat, so do pop some questions and um, can interrupt me if you have questions. We asked for each park to tell us what are, the, what are their concerns with pollinators and what is the action that they are concerned with that may or may not impact pollinators in their park. And these parks can be, have to be part of the larger, what we call natural resource parks. So of the 400 and change parks in the national park system, about 60 are in what are called natural resource parks. So it's a subset of all the national parks that are, are considered natural resource parks. So we can ask the park to look at these actions and you can break these actions into what we're calling bins, three different bins. And the idea of the bins is to then inform the sampling. And the, once we've informed the sampling, then we need to understand the bias of what we'll get from that sampling based on that approach, because we're not gonna get everything. And we need to say, bring that to the front because of this bias in, inherent in the data. So most parks actually have three questions or one of three questions. You can lump almost everything into one of these three questions in reference to the pollinators. One is mowing. That is the dominant question in all the parks. Every park mows, whether they're just mowing along a road, they're mowing around, they all mow around their visitor centers, almost every last one of them, um, or they're mowing for some purpose like a battlefield is being mowed for a view shed or, or a visitor experience. The second is what we're gonna end up calling patchy or other actions. You know, herbicides, prescribed fire that they parks burn and do different things. But on the landscape, they tend to be patches and they do these little bits and pieces that a park does its action. And they don't know the impact of these actions on pollinators. And the third of these are large scale disturbances. And we put restoration under disturbances. You know, where you have a large patch that you've now decided to restore to sagebrush, it used to be a cattle field, you're bringing it back in, or you tore down your visitor center and you're not going to build something back up in there and, or restore that landscape and try and figure out, okay, this big plot of land, is it restoring to a pollinator habitat? And what do we need to get there? So you see in the d disturbance, I've sort of given you a breakout that was area, but it's patchy or linear, whatever that disturbance sort of sorts itself out to. And we'll talk around that in a second. So it's important for us to think about that these management actions sort themselves into a field design approach. And those field design approach lead us to our sampling or sampling in the citizen science world using citizen science type data sets will then inform whether that management action does or does not based on a subset of samples that you can get in citizen science. And that's where this bias will come in. So here's the same thing, I'm gonna sort of break it down. I'm gonna walk through a couple of little pieces because I think it's really important that we think about um, citizen science and bias and, and in a good way, not a bad way, just in a good way. That's where you pay for it, attention to it in advance. So we have our management action and then we have this action matrix which I just walked through, mowing, disturbance and other. But I then separate out, you have management actions that have to do specifically with what we call species of concern. And that species of concern can have several different hats. It can be an international species of concern, a local species of concern or a federal status species of concern. And why that's important is because in the national park world, they can choose, the superintendent has the ability to, to make some choices. Federal status, they're required to manage. Local status, state or local, regional, they can decide how they want to manage it, they being the, the superintendent. And international status falls into the same bucket. 
the, the par individual park can decide how it's going to manage that resource. So take the monarch butterfly, perfect example. International status, it's listed as imperiled. It has no federal status as of this date. It is being proposed for federal status. It has no local, it has local status in a couple of states as being a species of concern. So each park can decide, okay, I'm gonna manage for monarchs or I'm not gonna manage for monarchs. Or, or am I concerned with my management action? Did I just mow down all the, the milkweed or did I try and save that milkweed with my mowing behaviors? So those are where species of concern come in as a separate track because there's some requirements in there. So if we take just the mowing piece and we'll walk through that next, let's just say for mowing, we need to think about three things. Because mowing, oops, there goes the squirrel. Um, mowing tends to go across several parameters. Where do you mow? When do you mow? And why do you mow? Because the timing of that is decided by those parameters, not by your ecosystem or, or your ecological indicator. And that causes issues when you are thinking about sampling. So here's the same thing, the management action, defines the sampling approach and the level of detail. How far down do you need to go in that? Whether you need to document critical habitat, like a species of concern, whether you actually need the species or maybe just need a group and whether it's proposed or documented. Has the species ever been seen there or the species actually never been seen there, but it's in the right habitat, rusty patch bumblebee, for an example. So what you do in that area is then informed because you're in a critical habitat area and you can only do some things and not other things in that habitat. So going back to mowing, here's an example of mowing. So if you're mowing for a species, and this is a, a one of the, called, of the group of blue butterflies, or for want of thing, they're called this whole group of blue butterflies, and they're super cool butterflies. So I'm highly biased towards this whole group. We have when, where, and why people mow. And the area has different shapes. It could be a lawn, like a parade ground, um, cemetery, battlefield, et cetera. It can be habitat edges around a visitor center, around trails, et cetera. And each of those would lead us to a different approach in the field. What we're calling a pollard walk, or actually it's a modified pollard walk, but those of you who know what pollard walks are, um, it's a modified version of that. And then we have what we call linear patrols. We have a long trail, you're, you're hiking, they wanna know what's happening along this trail. So you have the entire trail to do, or a road, you've mowed along the edge of a road, and you wanna know, um, who am I impacting by mowing along this road? But it's important to think of with highly mobile insects that some of those answers maybe your area is too small and the insects don't even notice, or you've created a concentration because this group happens to like edges and you just create a whole bunch of edges for this insect to, to move into. So the when in our ecology world, we tend to think about that as phenology, but in the mowing world, it may be rainfall we're gonna mow after it rains. So whenever it rains, we're gonna wait a little bit, then we're gonna mow. Or we're gonna mow when the visitors are not there. So you see the parameters that are gonna alter the habitat uh, can be highly variable based on the purposes when they mow and why they mow. If they're mowing for a cultural resource, like a battlefield, visitor experience, or we wanna get rid of ticks, or we're gonna mow things down because we think ticks will come if grass is too tall, or some other resource management concern. Um, a great one is Yellowstone, you let the grass group get to, large and all the elk move in and think this is a delightful idea. Um, and then you've got visitor and elk conflicts right next to the visitor center. Okay, so in our world, we think about phenology as a graph on the left. And so from the mowing world, the phenology which you just talked about is a graph on the right. So we now need to put these things back together. So we have our pollard walk, our linear patrol. We're thinking about mapping the scheduling of those actions around mowing. And they're mapping a schedule of actions around visitors and visitor experiences. But then you have the phenology of the actual organisms themselves and when those phenology may be active and when they're not active. And then when do all these things come together? And what is the influence of that on measuring your action, mowing, on pollinators, depending on when the pollinators actually occur in your park at that time. So this is what it looks like. We call this, you know, the set of a matrix to think about. If we're mowing disturbance or other, if we have an area patrol or patches, what types of things that parks do in terms of their management actions fall in little boxes? That helps us tell them, part. okay, park, we're gonna mow along your trails and roads 
our teams are going to walk linearly along this trail to roll. And that team is going to see certain classes of insects along the road. They can be doing the exact same thing in terms of netting, catching insects, trying to get them to think, but they're going to see different things along the road versus an area. And so important for us to transmit that back to the park. So you have a visitor center, you're going to get one sort of thing, a patrol, you may get a totally different set of things, or you may get some of the same. And a cultural feature, the same. You're going to mow it very low for whatever reason. So understanding, helping the parks understand how these management actions create a bias in the data set. Because your management actions are not the same. And for highly mobile insects that are specific to different habitats, for some reasons or the other, that data is not going to be comparable between a mowed area, an area of, of a long linear trail, and a patch. They may be very different. Um, it's important for everyone to recognize that. Okay, this is a little bit of what this looks like. Um, we mostly work right now for starters in the West. Um, we do have some parks in the Midwest and in the East. Um, so management action describes a large area. This is Grand Teton National Park. Um, this is a, a large slide zone. They want to think of, they want to find out what's going on in the slide zone. You see it's sage bus dominated, it's pretty thick. Modified pollard walk is pretty darn hard to walk want a straight line through there. So we have this mixed methods approach. You know, you have a modified walk, you have timed issues, and then we have a random sample that we want at the same time. And we use photography to verify all samples. So we do actually do netting. It's pretty hard to do in this particular site, um, but you also spend a lot of time working with photography because there's rocks underneath all of those stage brushes you can't see in this picture. It's, a, it's an avalanche zone. The second example is linear sampling. Um, this is actually from the Beartooth Plateau. You can look at trampling along trails, especially for high alpine trails. This is a consistent concern. Mount Rainier does this, uh, North Cascades, uh, Yosemite, uh, Cradle Lakes, all these sort of high visitation parks have trails that go up into higher elevation areas, Lost in Volcano, Sierra, the Sierra Nevada area. Finding out what the impact of your trail is. Um, for positive, for worse, is an important question that's often asked, especially on alpine systems. So the trail itself becomes your transect. I mean, we're often collecting along a long linear transect. Right? So we're using effort as a way to, to sort of quantify as we move down this long linear transect. Um, and then we collect, so collect what we call our mixed methods with our incidental samples versus our actually controlled samples at the same time. And the last is this what we call patches. And these are all these little oddball things. And parks are super fond of creating pollinator gardens. Um, and these patches are really important. And sort of understanding what these patches are doing. Um, are they successful? Or are they just becoming a weed bed for invasive species? So understanding patches and thinking about how patches move in park environments is super critical. These patches can be very small. Um, very often, you can just do a, in what we call an intensive Survey, you try and catch up with everything you see, pop them in a test tube, cool them down, and they get their pictures. So it's a mixed method approach, but we're not going to want to transect through a patch, right? You're not going to even think about it. This is across off next to a parking lot. And so the patch has all these different dynamics because it's a patch to think about. And so it's better to think about just an intensive sample of everything that's in that patch and work on your metadata to sort the data out. Okay, and in all three of these poaches, we use a really common thing, whether it's area, linear, or patch. We're always, at, because we're in national parks, we are focused very much on non-lethal handling. So we're not taking specimens unless we are directed to so by the park. So we're not doing bee bowls, we're not doing um, that type of camping. We're using hardcore citizen science. You know, take a picture and release it, hopefully, mostly intact. Sometimes you get you know, beat up wings and the whole, like, but your, your goal is to release everything live. If we do damage a sample during collections, we, we do actually take those back for the museums and do other work on that. So non-lethal handling is super straightforward and quite fun. You simply carry a lunch box out in the field with ice in it. Um, we use falcon tubes because we can get them free from our soil labs and they work super well and they're very durable. So these are oddball little tubes or I think a hundred, 100 milliliters, I can't remember their actual size. Um, so people use these all the time. We can pop insects, pretty much everything but the larger butterflies can actually fit in these tubes. Um, and they work super well for taking pictures because you can slow things down, cool them down, um, get them to walk around. And you see sometimes they just hang out on the lid of the box of the tube is their favorite thing to do while they're trying to warm up. And you can get pretty darn good pictures with a high resolution camera. 
then we upload those collection of pictures into iNaturalist um, for further identification. So the, the key to making this all work, to think about a management effort, and we've spent a little bit of time now after this on our issue of bias and getting to what we call research grade or getting accuracy, how do we get these species accurate, is we need to know our metadata. And we need to know all this effort, whether it's along the trail, whether it's in the area, et cetera, because when we get to citizen science data or what we currently are calling incidental observations that may fall outside of that, we need to be able to put these two data sets back together. Because again, remember we're in systematic data gaps. So you don't have that baseline data to say what all should be there to begin with, much less what might be missing for whatever reason. So you can't overlook the incidental data, but you need to be able to sort it from the metadata, how much effort time, et cetera, did we spend in this area, this past well on this trail, so that we can compare it um, across the management action. And then I'm gonna, now I'm gonna switch gears a little. So think about all that, weather, temperature, blah, blah, blah. Critical point, the participants themselves are part of our metadata. And because the participants, as we talked about yesterday, introduce a bias to the data that we simply should account for. We can't avoid it, we need to account for it. And because of that, we're gonna spend some time talking about this bias. But the second is that we also can't look at species population abundance per se. There are a lot of little guys out there and there are, to count the organisms is not necessarily what we're looking for in our original management action. We are looking for relative richness, ships, identification, that kind of thing. Um, because we're also doing a, a do no harm, leave no trace. So we're not capturing the specimens in a way that we can quantify them very easily. We're netting them and releasing them. Okay, so, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about bias and why the sampling bias based on participants is just an important measure that we add as our metadata. Um, because for citizen science field, I think we need to embrace this and not spend a whole lot of time worrying about it because it helps us answer a management question which has those three elements, nature, cultural, and visitor experience all mixed in. So it has these inherent things that a park is gonna be looking for, the natural environment, the cultural environment, and the visitor experience. And all three of those are mixed together with the question about the impact of the management action. So sampling bias is based on participants. And who collects the data changes your data and that's okay. It's just important to, the, to bring that into your analyses right up front to say, okay, Park, we're gonna go out and we're gonna answer this question, but understand that we're looking at data that has a systematic bias within it and we're gonna account for this bias. And this is why we're doing X, Y, or Z in the field to try and account for the biases that we see in the data or we know exist in the data. So whether you're a professional or a non-expert, can leave you to guess which one's a professional group and which is a non-expert group. Um, understanding that bias is really important because who collects the data in the world of aerial pollinators is so highly dependent on what you see, what you visually see and what you visually detect. So this bias is just so important. And it's based on basically three things of local knowledge that I wanna talk about, or so one is the content, of that local knowledge, the process of how you're gaining that knowledge and then the value of that knowledge to the visitor experience. And so, you know, one thing to think about in terms of content and this issue of local knowledge um, is by looking at this picture. And some of you may realize the, the anomaly here in this picture and some may not. And the cue is that the local knowledge where ecosystem indicators come in, which is a lot of what we do our research on is ecological indicators, what people pay attention to in an environment such that they notice changes in that system. So one of these is an American species and one is just not an American species, does not occur in America or on the American continent anywhere. And the bias is that one of these is used as an indicator and has been well mapped through time because it is well known and it's common. And the other is also common, well known, but it's not very well mapped. So the left is the hunt's bumblebee and the right is the white-tailed bumblebee from the UK. Okay, so this issue of content is that 
what people oh, sorry, sorry about the, what people can perceive is part of what they sample and they put in citizen science. So the presence or absence, like if you're in England, you know the white-tailed bumblebee is really common. It loves roses, it loves big roses. So it's very easy to photograph. It's a pretty big bumble, body bumblebee. So there's good knowledge about the importance of this particular indicator and why it's here and the presence or the absence of that indicator. So the perceived health of that group is easier to detect than it is for another one, the Hans bumblebee, because it's less known about it. So people take a look at that knowledge system tells us something about the particular species. And the second, this is a fun slide because I'll give you a couple minutes to look at. There are actually three Bs in the slide. And this is this problem of perception. Um, and that local knowledge processes, how we actually then go about collecting that data using someone is still based on what people see and what people detect in the environment and what people are willing to detect in the environment because that impacts our observations. So if you look at this picture and say, well, this is somebody take a picture of a flower and they actually, or we'll give you a hint that there are three bees in there, you may not see all three, but if you, if you stick a spider in there, you'll get a very different response from many people who are, for whatever reason have fear of spiders, but now you've just changed their observation, you've changed their bias, because they won't get on the ground on their belly to take a picture of this very tiny bee that's emerging on the flower. So they won't see it. So then it becomes an absence in your data. And that implication will then say, you will see this as a missing species. And for bees, this becomes in particular important because the bee she's taking a picture of is actually a newly emerged worker bee. So it's very small. So you may see the queen bee, but then you're missing the worker bees. So that gets back to this phenology mismatch problem. And then the third is this value of the knowledge. What do you do with this information? Um, and what does the park do with this information? And this gets back to the very last portion of my talk, which is thinking about, do you need species? Because it depends on your audience. Uh, in, not so much the question, but really on your audience. So in, we have species complexes that are very different, difficult to, to sort apart. And what is the value of sorting apart that species complex may be based on something that is not part of the management action. And so to be able to sort that out and helping a park sort that out, it's like, okay, maybe you just need to know you have all the lesser fiddlers here in one big group. And trying to sort them out may or may not be interesting for that park. Now, if I tell them the same group that, you know, they're really sensitive to temperature and we're getting some weird morphological patterns. Um, this is this picture, particular pictures in Yosemite. And they've been getting some of the um, fairly common fiddlers coming out as almost black. They're really dark. It's really sort of interesting. And the group is known to be very plastic. So is this a value to understanding how the species is shifting its appearance? Coleus butterflies do the same thing. They shift their color, they shift their experience. So if that's part of the question, understanding coleus distribution, understanding that, then yeah, we need to get down to that knowledge of the actual species. But if it's not, we may not need to. And that changes the approach in the field. Okay, so content and value is getting down to this sampling bias is really based on the easy identification. And when we get to species accuracy, understanding how you can get something to research grade and why, and how you can use that data accurately to say, these are my species that occur here versus ones that I'm always gonna struggle to get to research grade or to get to be accurate because no matter what you do, they're hard to identify, um, particularly on some of the smaller groups. So these are just two examples of you know one butterfly, Everybody will chase swallowtails no matter what you do. Um, people are grand time chasing swallowtails around. Pretty easy to identify, we only have a couple of species. In contrast, the checker spot, we've got a whole complex out there. They're super hard to tell apart. There are a bunch of them when they're out. And unless you sit there and wave your net for hours on end, you probably won't get all of them. And questions are, have you missed the rare or endangered one? It can be pretty high, unless you're focused on it and unless your question is regarding that group. So this gets to the field specimen identification, like I suggested. And, and there are two things to think about. One, which is just picture on the left, is think about when you have an invasive species, like the honeybee, getting that down to species is really critical. So for example, we just got a queen bumblebee at that site, or sorry, queen honeybee at that site I showed you earlier in Grand Teton National Park. This bee does not belong there. It's a queen, that's the problem, right? Because you, 
potential of maybe getting a hive or something deep inside the park's boundaries. Um, what are the impact? I don't think the park necessarily knows, but the fact of that information was important for the park to know, yes, you do have honeybees that are moving into your park and they're showing pretty high up in elevation. They're showing up, we got this one about 9,000 feet. So it's important to know that for a park. The second year species like fiddlers who are, can be remarkably friendly, they love sweaty fingers and the like, and you can spend the time trying to figure them out and figure out what they're trying to, the stories they're trying to tell you in the field and you can get lots of them. So understand that difference between species complex, when do you need to use them and when do you not need to use them? But in the identification process, we have a different community and that community getting to research grade can be global. And the global taxonomic community, especially in places like iNaturalist, um, is what you rely on to get something to species, which means that your field data needs to come back in the form that you can get it to species. And this is this gets us into a whole thing that we do with photography and trying to get our photography up to snuff so that we can get accurate species identification of our specimen. Okay, so second part I wanna talk, talk really briefly is about this systematic data gaps and species occurrence records um, and how we build our data accuracy back and forth by thinking about virtual data sets. And in today's world, thanks to maybe not thanks is not the right word, but let's just say post-COVID world, the amount of data available online is, is kind of eye-popping. Um, many, many more museums have data online. There are lots of big data sets that are becoming more easy to access that help you assess to what species occur, where, who you should be looking for, um, whether you've actually ever set foot in that park yet or not. And this changes the dis definition of who your community is that's participating in this park and how data can come into the park um, and then how you ver verify that data, which may be global and not local. Okay, so let me just walk through some data and pay attention to my time and project. We'll make sure we have time for questions. It's just some data from our project, the Pollinators National Parks, we call it the PINS project. We had eight units of the park that we sampled this last summer and just give you a, a sense of what our data is and some of these challenges of getting to species accuracy and understanding the data, the, the bias within the data. So here are eight parks. Um, it's a mix of national monuments that are very dry um, to Midwest parks, all the way to the Yosemite, Crater Lake, Boston Butte. This year we're adding, um, sorry, uh, Lawson Volcano, Lewis and Clark on the coast, um, and I'm missing a couple, and Oregon Caves next to Crater Lake. So, we're, we, and the parks are chosen by the Park Service um, based on their management actions, what actions they've put together and their need to have pollinator data. So this is kind of what your data looks like when you think about this focus. And so these are number of species occurrence records that our team went through for these eight parks, 90,000 records um, on a variety of different data sets, which asks the simple question as to, okay, who is gonna occur in these eight parks or who do we expect in these eight parks to create that baseline data? Remember we have the systematic data gap for all these parks. And what's interesting you know, is we'll, and we'll have a good time highlighting what the National Park Service itself records since I used to work for them. Um, and you notice there's not a lot of records in, in the parks and this actually gets worse when you look at some of the smaller parks. So here's this issue of figuring out what occurs in a park. Are, are you at research grade or is, or is your specimen correct? Especially if it's something that's not expected in the park or something new. And then making sure you compile that accuracy so you can say with species. Remember that species of concern, we wanna make sure we're not hitting species of concern at the same time as so we're trying to collect this accurate background data. So here's where we want to problem. If you look at NPC, NP list, which is the list of the Park Service itself keeps, so you notice it has that Yosemite doesn't have a single insect on their list. So they have a, a record of zero. Um, and you notice other parks have this problem with their internal records that they just show zero as a list. So the first thing you need to do is sort of figure out uh, how are you going to approach this park's data and where you're getting this data. And this is where citizen science comes in. The citizen science data sets, as you can see, for iNaturalist, like Yosemite, there are 2,000 records versus zero for the exact same part of Yosemite that we were sampling, and 20,000 records in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So you can see there are huge differences in these numbers, um, of which we collect about 200, 255 specimens in part because a wildfire came through the park and um, we were required to leave. We didn't finish our sample there. 
So what you can do with this data, is you can go back to our research questions, what we do is, we, and you can actually, anyone can look these up. We put in, we call bee gu guides for every one of our eight parks that includes our bumblebees and butterflies, um, where they've been collected on all citizen science data sets. And then we compare that to all the virtual data sets. So you can see the citizen science data sets or if you're on iNaturalist, um, they can build these guides. These are super cool to do because they're accessible, but be careful because these are everybody's data. So you can't, you know, there's copyright issues and how you pull these things offline. Um, but you can see what has been recorded. You can create a guide for the park based just on the species list that's been seen in the park. So you have this verifiable species occurrence record. And why it becomes important is to get to this accurate identification, we want to get as many of our observations to research grade as possible. And with this and graphic on the left is showing you that bias, bias, bias. Some things you can get to research grade fairly easily and some things you simply cannot. So the blue line is butterflies, uh, the red line is bees, uh, mostly bombus, um, and then the yellow is some of these other orders, especially some of the smaller native bees, surfer flies, et cetera, that are really hard to get to species um, uh, or to get to research grade on iNaturalist. So what we're trying to demonstrate is that there's this subset because people take pictures of what they observe, what they see, what they detect, what they love for whatever reason. And many of those we can get to very high levels of accuracy. We write about 85% accuracy on some of these common species, while others, they're just as important pollinators, are much higher, harder to get to the same level of accuracy. I and mean, in thinking about how you can adjust those data sets to accommodate that. And so this is what some of our output data looks like. And this is again, just year one. So we send the, what we call highlights to the park to say, okay, this is what we found in year one of your park. We're gonna go back and you know, update these records and change them and adjust them as things shift around. And I'll walk through these three. And if anyone is interested, we, we, we publish these for each of the parks um, and they'll be published on our pollinator webpage. So you can pull them down and just see what these highlights look like. And they're meant to be just that, just highlights of the field effort. So the first part is understanding the species occurrence record based on the question we were asked to address. So it's really important that we're not sampling the entire park, we're simply sampling what we were asked to address and what that difference is of what we saw within that park's context. So it gives us a subset, a snapshot of a different question for each park because we're focused on the management action and what might occur there. And the second is that we sort of then pull together of all those records, we cross list it with species of concern, focusing mainly on bees and butterflies, bumblebees in particular and butterflies, and we crosswalk it to come up with records for phenology. When's the best time based again, just on the phenology. Remember we go back and then we compare it to their mowing records or the management action that we were asked to do. What would we expect to occur in that park at that time? And what would be something to pay attention to? And then third, which is really important for the park is understanding what's new to the park. What is a park record? What's a rare species? What's the species are concerned? Where is it occurring? Um, where are we expecting it? And did, and did we detect it? So you see like, for example, for Nebraska, um, the American bumblebee is one of these things that's listed as vulnerable on a local survey. It doesn't yet have a full its status. I think it's still being proposed as vulnerable where they have others that are um, listed internationally as threatened, like the monarch and um, IUCN lists one or two others in that park. I think they have 13 species total in some of the parks that are listed, all have different listing categories of concern. So I wanna close out with just a couple of, of just little comments about thinking about why these butterflies are important to think about. And my favorite are these little blue butterflies. And um, the word I was having trouble pronouncing yesterday is Myra Filey, um, which is ant raised butterflies. Butterflies are raised by ants who obligate relationships or facilitative relationships. This is a super cool little system, but it also means that these are, these mostly use grasses as their host plants are super susceptible to grazing. Um, and land restoration that has high ground disturbance, what we're finding so far is a loss of the ants, which is leading to a decline in survivorship of the blues. 
So it's a really interesting sort of piece of being able to think about, okay, how, how do we help a part, tell a story about restoration through both citizen science, so we use citizen science approaches to, to document all these blue butterflies, um, but also let them know that the restoration is missing a piece of the ecosystem, um, which is these smaller blue butterflies that are currently missing in sagebrush restoration sites. And we don't spend a lot of time on pollinators who are not bees and butterflies. We try and document them. It's a horrible picture, and I apologize for that. Um, but I love these little guys, you know, the, the, the big moths that are busy pretending to be pollinators, and they're very good at pollinating, but you know, they're in the moth group, they're not in the butterfly group. And we've obviously got a piles and piles of flies that are really good at pollinating, but not necessarily things that we're picking up. Again, going back to that bias from the data, which ones are hard to identify, which ones are not hard to identify, which ones are hard for people to detect. We do get some of these hawk moths and the um, hummingbird moths because they're easy to detect and they're not species rich. There's one or two species that you'll get in the area. and They're really easy to identify and they're really pretty. Okay, so to close up, you know, when you think about pollinators and citizen science and management actions, the management action needs to define our approach on the ground. And the citizen science defines the bias. Every observer has a bias. And we need to integrate these two, so they call it integrated resource management approach to create a solution that also engages the public. And that's where the citizen science comes back in. So we are looking at inventories, we're thinking about pollinators in the context of how we engage the public to get us towards land conservation, to get us towards a protection of an ecosystem processes. And we're using these indicators as a way to say, hey, we need to pay more attention to pollinator gardens. We need to think about how we mow, when we mow, what's our mowing height, and why does it matter to one group of organisms versus another? And so management actions, what I call it embracing the bias. Um, when you take management actions and you need to engage the public with understanding pollinator decline, as we said, especially in high elevation parks, you need to embrace that bias and, and go with the things that people will protect, pay attention to, take pictures of, provide you with that data such that you can protect what we love, we can protect our park systems, and we can answer this larger question about are they actually declining in the park area for that subset of, of species. And with that, I think it's my last slide. I can stop sharing. I just want to say, you know, that shout out and thanks to the National Park Service for support of this project and the Rocky Mountain Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit Task Agreement. We also received funding from the National Science Foundation um, through the Lewis Stokes uh, Minority Participation in Science Award to increase students' engagements in science. And with that, I'll stop sharing and see you hopefully we still have some time for some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowser. Uh, yeah, everybody can give a round of applause.